All right, good morning as always to everyone tuning in for the talk. Um, I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the Deputy Director here at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, today we're going to hear from Dr. Aaron Miles, who's currently on assignment as a Senior Advisor in the U.S. Department of State's Office of Strategic Stability and Deterrence. Uh, his CGSR lecture talk this morning is titled Lessons in Deterrence from Russia's War in Ukraine. I don't have to explain to anyone why this particular topic is timely and important since we had over 500 people from the lab tune in about a month ago for a CGSR roundtable discussion immediately after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to introduce the discussion other than to say thank you to Aaron for putting something together um, for the lab on, on sort of just the right time on this topic of, you know, what is deterrence? Uh, did it succeed or fail? And what that all means for nuclear deterrence, for extended deterrence, um, for our allies and partners, um, for strategic stability and arms control, for all of these dimensions, because we're at this point, you know, five or six weeks now into the conference that people are starting to do some, some naval gazing, some backward looking, some, if only we had done this, maybe this could have all been prevented type talk. And I think, I think Aaron's presentation is going to sort of wonderfully outline, you know, what it is you can do, what you can't do, and, and sort of what the implications are and what it all means. So let me say just a little bit about the speaker. Uh, Aaron Miles is, is a fellow at the Center for Global Security Research. Um, like I said, he's currently on assignment at the State Department. Um, prior to that, he was previously in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as the Principal Assistant Director for National Security and International Affairs and as Assistant Director for Nuclear and Strategic Technologies. Um, he's been uh, also in the office of the Secretary of Defense as a senior policy advisor on nuclear deterrence. Um, prior to all of these, these DC experiences, uh, Aaron has been a research physicist at here at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. He's worked, researched, and written on a, on a range of policy, science, and security topics. Um, deterrence, nuclear weapons, arms control, nonproliferation, fusion energy, astrophysics, space nuclear power propulsion, research security, and planetary defense. Um, he has a PhD in physics from the University of Maryland, um, a graduate certificate in national security studies from Texas A&M, and a BS in physics and a BA in Russian from Arizona State University. Um, for those of you sort of new to the CGSR lecture experience, um, the ground rules, um, Aaron's going to talk for about 30 to 45 minutes, um, at which point we'll open the floor for, dis for discussion. Um, please raise your hand electronically. Please submit your questions to me in the chat function, so as soon as Aaron's done with his PowerPoint presentation, um, we can get the discussion rolling quickly and get as many of your questions and comments as possible in the time allotted. We have about 240 people um, on the line and rising. So Aaron, thank you for being with us today and, and over to you. Oh, you're still muted, Aaron. How about now? There we go. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for uh, allowing me to come and, and share this talk. I'm really looking forward to the, the discussion afterward and happy to um, speak about uh, some, some lessons of, uh, on deterrence from Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, someone else is going to share my slides. Is that a, is that a true story? I'm, uh, I'm doing it now. Okay. All right. Um, I, that's, I'm going to go ahead and get started because uh, you know there's a title slide and then you can you can flip over to the outline and and there I'll just say that uh, as people are well aware on uh, February 24th Vladimir Putin launched a large scale invasion of Ukraine and since then has waged a brutal war against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people so how did we get here and what lessons can we draw about deterrence and about nuclear deterrence in particular. I, um, there's a range of views on this. I, I don't consider this to be necessarily a nuclear crisis, at least uh, not up to this point, but it is a crisis and a conflict that contains nuclear crisis elements. And I, I'd like to start out by highlighting some of these elements, uh, focusing on uh, those more recent elements, but, but beginning with some important historical ones. And if you can go ahead to the uh, next slide and, and go ahead to the next slide as well. Thank you. So on December, uh, in, in December 1994, uh, Russia, the UK, United States, and Ukraine, and, and uh, in, in parallel Belarus and Kazakhstan, signed the, the Budapest Memorandum. 
Uh, this welcomed Ukraine's ascension to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT, as a non-nuclear weapons state. It also recognizes Ukraine's commitment to eliminate all nuclear weapons from its territory, which, which uh, really meant to return them to Russia. The other signatories committed to uh, first respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine. It's important always to note here that the, the, the word there is respect, uh, not defend. Uh, second, to refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity and political independence of Ukraine, and that none of their weapons will ever be used against Ukraine except in self-defense. Uh, refrain from economic coercion against Ukraine. Seek immediate US, uh, UN uh, Security Council action to provide assistance to Ukraine if it is attacked or threatened with the attack of nuclear weapons, not use nuclear weapons against Ukraine, and finally, to consult with, with the other signatories, if a, if a situation arises which re raises questions concerning these commitments. So Ukraine subsequently followed through on, on its commitments to re relinquish all nuclear weapons on its territory, and it verifiably dismantled the associated infrastructure. So jumping forward then to February 2014, this is uh, when Russia for the first time violates uh, the Budapest Memorandum, at least in a, in a very dramatic way, by invading eastern Ukraine and attempting to annex Crimea. In spring of last year, uh, continuing into February of this year, Russia amasses an invasion force along Ukraine's border while publicly, loudly, and repeatedly dismissing U.S. warnings of a potential further invasion as uh, what they love to call baseless anti-Russian hysteria. Uh, January 3rd, Russia joins the United States and the other P5 nations in a joint statement on preventing nuclear war and avoiding arms races. That statement includes the declaration that, quote, we affirm that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Uh, as nuclear use would have far-reaching consequences, we also affirm that nuclear weapons, for as long as they continue to exist, should serve defensive purposes, deter aggression, and prevent war. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll, we'll move forward to January 10th, when the United States and Russia joined in a so-called extraordinary session uh, of the U.S.-Russian uh, Strategic Stability Dialogue, or SSD. Uh, and this, the purpose of this discussion was to, was to uh, discuss the escalation of the crisis. The SSD was established last summer as a mechanism for bilateral engagement on nuclear weapons and other strategic issues. Uh, Russia's core demands, um, I think familiar to a lot of people, were number one, no NATO membership for Ukraine, two, no further eastward expansion of NATO, and three, rollback of NATO infrastructure and deployments to NATO circa 1997, prior to the bulk of uh, post-Cold War NATO enlargement. Uh, various other proposals they, they also brought forward related to uh, deployment of ground-based missiles in Europe, uh, limits on the size and scope of military exercises as, as a couple examples. The United States conveyed willingness to engage on a range of these security issues, uh, including uh, uh, missile placement in Europe, reciprocal restraints on uh, military exercises, and next steps in nuclear arms control, uh, all uh, contingent on Russian de-escalation of the crisis. Uh, the United States was not willing to close NATO's open door policy or to acquiesce to those uh, those demands. Subsequently, there was an exchange of, of so-called non-papers between uh, the, the, the two capitals um, uh, over the next month on issues uh, that, that were raised in the in the SSD. By the way, it's always interesting to point out uh, a nice quote by Russian Deputy Foreign Minister, Minister Sergei Lyakov immediately following the session when he told reporters, quote, we explained to our counterparts that there were no plans or intentions to attack, quote unquote, Ukraine. Uh, we don't have it and we can't have it. There is no single reason to be afraid of any escalation. February 19th, uh, Putin oversees strategic nuclear exercises. Uh, according to the official Russian statements, uh, these included launches of an ICBM, a submarine launch ballistic missile, dual capable cruise missiles, Kinshal air launch ballistic missiles, and the new Zircon. Uh, hypersonic missile. And for anyone counting, that's uh, two of Putin's five uh, so-called nuclear superweapons announced in his March 2018 State of the Nation address. Uh, Putin also included a special guest at these exercises, and that was Belarusian President Lukashenko, on whose territory 
um, Russia by that time had tens of thousands of Russian troops arrayed along the Ukrainian border. February 24th, uh, Russian forces initiate Putin's expanded in invasion of Ukraine. That same day, uh, Putin gives a speech announcing and describing the invasion as uh, what he calls a special military operation to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Of course, referring to it as a war or invasion is now illegal in Russia. Putin's remarks included what many have interpreted as a veiled nuclear threat for the United States and NATO when he said, I would like uh, to say something very important for those who may be tempted to interfere in these developments from the outside. They must know that Russia will respond immediately and the consequences will be such as you have never seen in your entire history. No matter how the events unfold, we are ready. All the necessary decisions in this regard have been taken. I hope that my words will be heard. That same day, President Biden uh, condemns Russia's invasion while also reiterating, quote, our forces are not, are not, and will not be engaged in the conflict with Russia in Ukraine. Our forces are not going to Europe to fight in Ukraine, but to defend our NATO allies and reassure those allies in the East. As I made crystal clear, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory with the full force of American power. There is no doubt that the United States <clears throat> and every NATO ally will meet our Article 5 commitments, which says that an attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, next slide, please. The next day, February 25th, <clears throat> the United States suspends the Strategic Stability Dialogue, along with many other forms of U.S.-Russian engagement, while continuing to implement all legal obligations under the New START Treaty. Uh, into the, towards the end of that month and, and through March, you can see Russia promulgating a series of false claims, <clears throat> likely primarily for uh, domestic consumption, to the effect that uh, Ukraine is seeking to develop nuclear weapons for use against Russia, and that the United States is aware of and assisting with these efforts. Uh, Putin really started this in his February 24th speech in which he claimed that, quote, Ukrainian leadership has gone as far as uh, aspire to acquire nuclear weapons. February 27th, three days uh, after this uh, expanded invasion, Belarus passes a referendum that modifies its constitution to remove its commitment to remaining a non-nuclear weapon state and to allow for potential future redeployment of Russian nuclear weapons on Belarusian territory. That same day, Putin uses a televised address to order his strategic forces on a, quote, special regime, regime of combat duty. Uh, this really sets off a flurry of activity in, in, among U.S. experts and non-experts alike as they scramble to figure out what a special regime of combat duty might possibly mean. Uh, while many have characterized this as, as raising the nuclear alert level or something to that effect, Defense Minister Shoigu later sought to clarify it as um, increased manning, basically, at, at command posts. Uh, there were, of course, responses to this. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg uh, described it as dangerous rhetoric and behavior which is irresponsible. At the same time, the White House and State Department responded that we, uh, quote, see no reason to change our own alert level. Uh, March 2nd, the Pentagon announced postponement of a scheduled Minuteman 3 ICBM test launch. Press statements uh, included, included the following. Uh, last weekend, President Putin directed a special alert of Russian nuclear forces. Such provocative rhetoric and possible changes to nuclear posture involving the most consequential weapons in our respective arsenals is unacceptable. The United States has not taken any similar steps. And so in an effort to demonstrate that we have no intention in engaging in any actions that can be misunderstood or misconstrued, the Secretary of Defense has directed that our Minuteman 3 uh, ICBM test launch scheduled for this week uh, to be postponed. And, and those paying attention to the news uh, will likely have noticed that um, uh, over the weekend, there was reporting that that uh, postponed test was actually, is now, uh, now actually canceled. Uh, March 11th, President Biden reiterates his previous position that U.S. military forces will not fight in Ukraine, including through establishment of a no-fly zone. He says, we will not fight a war against Russia in Ukraine. Direct confrontation between NATO and Russia is World War III, something we must strive to prevent. Uh, just understand and don't kid yourself, no matter what you all say, that's called World War III. So that brings us up through basically the first month of the war, 
Nuclear weapons play an explicit role in several of these instances, while in others they represent that, that shadow that hangs over many acute crises and uh, conflicts involving nuclear armed states. Next slide, please. So before going uh, further, I'd like to uh, kind of, uh, before getting into the, the lessons that we can draw, um, I'd like to take a brief definitional pause, even though most in this audience uh, don't really need it. But let me just say there, you know, there are many different ways, really equivalent ways of saying this, but I'll define deterrence as uh, preventing some action by threatening to respond in ways that the actor expects would impose costs that exceed the benefits the actor seeks to achieve. In other words, as uh, my older brother would say when we were kids, don't hit me or I'll hit you back so hard you wish you hadn't. Um, we could refine this definition in a couple of ways. First, by adding to the right side of the equation any expected costs of restraint, because restraint is rarely, if ever, a cost-free proposition. And we could also add to the left side of the equation any inducements offered for restraint, since it is possible to offer good things uh, along with threatening to punish. I'd also like to highlight the usage of, of the word expects here in this definition, which reflects the psychological nature of deterrence. It's a, mathematically, it's an expectation value that factors in both the magnitude of the benefit if achieved or the cost if imposed and the likelihood of achieving that benefit or suffering that cost. It's based on benefits the actor expects to achieve rather than seeks to achieve. And similarly, what matters is the cost the actor expects to suffer rather than just the cost that one is capable of imposing or that one uh, says it will impose. And this is why discussions of resolve, commitment, and relative stakes are so prominent in deterrence analysis and why extended deterrence poses uh, a particular challenge. Nuclear deterrence really occupies a, a somewhat a unique place in this definitional space because nuclear weapons can, in principle, impose such high costs that the expectation value can be significant even when the perceived likelihood of a nuclear response is very low. To me, this accounts for what would otherwise be a, a somewhat disjointed coexistence that, that sometimes seems to be there uh, among some people um, who, state, who have a stated belief that nuclear deterrence is ineffective together with, with what appears to be a robust fear of nuclear employment. And I'll, I'll come back to that later on. Next slide, please. So uh, perhaps the, the most basic question that we can ask about uh, nuclear deterrence is whether or not it is real. Uh, or to quote an old uh, David Letterman sketch that, that I remember seeing, is this anything? Uh, this was where uh, the curtain would rise, if you remember, uh, and it would reveal just a few seconds of, of some stunner performance, like a, a guy juggling while balancing on a ladder. Uh, and then Dave and, and, and Paul would discuss whether and decide whether it is something or, or nothing. So we could ask that question about deterrence. There are, after all, uh, those who argue that nuclear deterrence is not real or, or that at least there's little to no evidence of it ever having any real impact. Uh, for example, uh, David uh, Brash, not Letterman, uh, in 2018 published an article titled Nuclear Deterrence is a Myth, in which he argues there is no proof that nuclear deterrence ever worked, nor that it ever will. Singling out nuclear deterrence as the reason why the Cold War never became hot is somewhat like saying that a junkyard car without an engine or wheels never sped off the lot because no one turned the key. Post facto arguments, especially negative ones, might be the currency of pundits, but are impossible to prove and offer no solid ground for evaluating a counterfactual claim, conjecturing why something has not happened. Now, this argument reflects a real difficulty in assessing the role in deterrence in many instances in which the act one seeks to deter does not materialize. However, the current situation is one in which I think we can plainly see nuclear deterrence in action. And this is especially apparent if we judge against uh, a little bit kind of a more reasonable bar uh, because while the ultimate objective of deterrence is, of course, to prevent some action, what we really mean is to influence an adversary's calculus in a way that substantially reduces the likelihood that the adversary chooses to take that action. So we can ask in the current crisis, is there evidence that nuclear deterrence plays a substantial role in decreasing the likelihood of some action? And I think the answer is yes. In this case, we can see uh, in particular, that Russia's nuclear deterrent threats have a meaningful impact on American calculus. Uh, 
Taking the specific example of Ukraine's request for a no-fly zone, we can readily see nuclear deterrent success reflected in expressions that range from uh, official government uh, statements all the way to the always indisputable wisdom to be found in uh, public comments posted on online news stories. And we go to the, the next slide. That's an example. So we, we have Secretary Blinken on, on March 6th. When asked why the United States has ruled out a no-fly zone, he said, the president also has a responsibility to not get us into a direct conflict, a, nu a, a direct war with Russia, a nuclear power, and risk a war that expands even beyond Ukraine to Europe. Uh, Senator Chris Murphy on Twitter, uh, there's been a lot of loose talk from smart people about close air support and no-fly zones for Ukraine. Let's just be clear what that is, the US and Russia at war. It's a bad idea, and Congress would never authorize it. Direct war between the world's two nuclear powers should be a non-starter. A Vox News article on why even a limited no-fly zone is a bad idea says calls for a NATO-imposed no-fly zone of Ukraine have been hampered by one big problem. Enforcing a no-fly zone would necessarily entail shooting at Russian planes and carry a significant risk of leading to a nuclear exchange. An MSNBC article on why increasing talk of a no-fly zone over Ukraine is troubling says the policy would amount to a declaration of war on Russia and cause the odds of nuclear exchange to surge. And a, and a, a Yahoo News article, even in, in this case, someone advocating for uh, a no-fly zone on why we need a no-fly zone for Ukraine says, if Russia lacked nukes, is there any doubt the West would aid Ukraine militarily? And this list could go on and on and on. So is nuclear deterrence a myth? No, uh, we are today experiencing a case where nuclear deterrence substantially reduces the likelihood of military involvement and therefore, and thereby is playing a real and non-mythical and significant role. Now, this still does not prove, uh, and there probably remains no way to prove that the United States would uh, implement a no-fly zone over Ukraine if not for Russia's nuclear threats, but it does show real people whose calculus regarding taking military action appears to be meaningfully influenced by Russian nuclear deterrent threats backed by their response capabilities. I would go even further and posit that if we ask ourselves whether absent nuclear weapons, and, and as we sit here today, we would be substantially more inclined to support a no-fly zone or other forms of military involvement in Ukraine, if not for Russian nuclear weapons, the honest answer for many of us would be yes. Uh, next slide, please. This case highlights another important element of nuclear deterrence. Those who appear influenced by Putin's nuclear threats are not saying, at least for the most part, that Russia would definitely escalate to nuclear employment uh, or would do so right away. Many are not even saying that a nuclear response would be likely. But because the potential consequences are so high, even a small chance of nuclear escalation can sometimes make deterrence effective. Another important element that we get to observe in, in, in real time here is the perception is that the, the perception of the most likely initial nuclear response is not necessarily what is influencing people's calculus. Rather, many individuals appear to believe that some nuclear response is plausible and are deterred by the potential for subsequent further escalation. And this is, again, in, in real time, this is uh, Schelling's threat that leaves something to chance. There's also a lesson in the diversity of reactions to Russia's nuclear deterrent threats, which illustrates that fundamental principle that deterrence is a psychological phenomenon that, that sometimes must be tailored to the specific actor. The thing that deters one person is not necessarily the thing that will deter another, let alone the thing that will deter all people. Relatedly, the fact that nuclear threats can deter some things does not mean that they can deter all things. The Russian nuclear threats that we see contributing to deterrence of US military involvement have not deterred and were probably not designed or expected to, to deter US provision of lethal military aid to the Ukrainians. Next slide, please. It's also interesting to explore the thinking of those who argue that the United States should not be deterred by Russia's nuclear uh, threats from imposing a no-fly zone or undertaking other military engagement in Ukraine. Their arguments collectively seem to reflect four basic lines of reasoning and illustrate important arguments within nuclear deterrence theory. Uh, first, the first of these, these arguments is that Putin will not implement his nuclear threats 
because that would mean society ending nuclear exchange. Putin is evil, but not uh, suicidal. Ergo, we should, uh, or at least could proceed with a no-fly zone. Whether explicitly or implicitly, these people are expressing the view that any nuclear use between major nuclear powers will inevitably lead to full escalation. And also the view that this is a universally under, uh, understood view held by everyone. Rejecting the notion of even striving to limit nuclear escalation following first use implies a belief that in the event of, of limited nuclear attack, the most irrational uh, ultimate choice is guaranteed. And that deep down, Putin and everyone else holds the same view. I would say that this line of, of, of thinking uh, appears to be reflected in a recent arms control wonk podcast titled The Bunga Bunga Theory of Deterrence, wherein uh, Jeffrey Lewis and his co-host Aaron Stein do not worry about nuclear escalation because Putin appears to still value his fancy life. Others would not put the probability uh, of nuclear use at zero, um, but sufficiently low that the, that the risk is worth, um, uh, is worth taking, given all that Putin is wreaking in Ukraine, uh, upon Ukraine, and upon the global order. I would say this appears to be the position of retired General uh, Philip Breedlove, former Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. On March 3rd, General Breedlove and uh, 26 uh, prominent others signed a letter calling for establishment of a limited no-fly zone over Ukraine. Breedlove indicates his thinking in uh, these excerpts I have here from uh, uh, an NPR interview given that same day to Michelle Pfeiffer, who, who says, the US has enforced no-fly zones in the past in other places. Why is there reluctance to do so over Ukraine? Breedlove answers, very simply, the opponent that we face today we are very reticent to have a war with a nuclear power that is already talking about using nuclear weapons. Pfeiffer, would you still support the idea of a no-fly zone over Ukraine if you knew it would provoke Russia to use nuclear weapons? Breedlove says, no, nobody wants a nuclear war. So then it's a gamble to put a no-fly zone into effect. Breedlove says, yeah, that's your word. That's not the word I would use. What word would you use? It's a calculated military decision. So he's done his calculation. The risk is sufficiently low uh, in, in, his, uh, in his mind that it justifies uh, taking this, this action. Now, the second line of reasoning is almost the opposite of this, not that uh, escalation is certain, uh, but that even if Putin chooses, uh, if he does use nuclear weapons in a limited way, the risk of subsequent total escalation is actually very low because uh, it would be irrational and we can count on one side or the other or, or both to control escalation. And I include this here because it's what many critics of nuclear deterrence think that nuclear uh, deterrence proponents believe, that is that one can have confidence in the ability to control nuclear escalation, even though as, as far as I can tell, very few, if, if any, actually hold that view. Now, the third line of reasoning is that whatever the risk is today, it will only grow over time if we do not act now. A strategic success in Ukraine will further embolden Putin such that sooner or later, he will move against NATO, at which point we will be obligated to act under even more dangerous circumstances. Better to do what we can now uh, to ensure a strategic defeat for Putin that will hopefully mean uh, perhaps even the beginning of the, of the end of his regime. These are, these are arguments for preventive war. Uh, that is accepting the cost of acting now in order to avoid a worse or more perilous conflict in the future. This line of thinking was reflected in the last of the news articles that I cited above, in which after bemoaning the success of Russia's nuclear deterrent threats, the author asks, will the West allow Ukraine to be a precedent for future nuclear bullying that will enable Russia to reacquire the former Warsaw Pact countries for Xi to attack Taiwan? Now, the fourth line of reasoning is that Putin will not implement his nuclear threats because there simply is no plausible strategic logic to such a move. That is, nuclear employment would not help Putin achieve any of his core objectives. On this point, I would say that uh, it's somewhat situation dependent. There is, for example, uh, no clear strategic logic to Putin using nuclear weapons in Ukraine to compel the United States and others to lift sanctions. It's very hard to see how, how even he could imagine that that might succeed. But I'm not ready to rule out entirely the possibility 
that that um, <clears throat> of limited nuclear employment in Ukraine with the threat of continuing use to force Ukrainians to negotiate a rapid settlement on terms favorable to Russia. Now, to be clear, I think this is extremely unlikely still. Uh, it would be a hugely risky move. It would be certain to have long-term negative consequences for, for Russia, but it's not entirely without strategic logic in, in the same way that, that some of these other scenarios might be. Next slide, please. Finally, this instance of, of, of Russia deterring US imposition of a no-fly zone raises an important question. Does Russia, as the aggressor state, gain an asymmetric benefit from nuclear deterrence? It certainly is easier in this case, in this crisis, to identify instances of Russia successfully applying nuclear deterrence to the United States and our allies than the other way around. That said, I'm not prepared to draw a general conclusion on this point just yet. Putin might possess a greater general willingness to take risks, and the same authoritarian nature of his regime that makes it easier for him to take risks on behalf of his country also makes it easier for him to undertake aggression. But there's also an apparent asymmetry of stakes in this situation, with Russia, or, or at least Putin, perceiving deeper interests in Ukraine than does the United States. It's not surprising that this would translate into willingness to take greater risks, and that greater willingness is not necessarily related to Russia's role as the aggressor. Furthermore, where US and NATO nuclear deterrence does apply, there is no indication of flagging resolve. In a March 9th statement, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said of, of NATO's uh, deterrence posture, uh, uh, NATO has a responsibility to ensure that this conflict does not escalate beyond Ukraine, so our allies are also significantly increasing our defensive presence in the east of the alliance. This sends a clear message that we will protect and defend every inch of allied territory. In a subsequent Q&A with uh, Canada's, Canada's NATO ambassador, uh, the ambassador said many commentators are worried that the risk of President Putin resorting to uh, the nuclear option is at the highest risk that we have seen, to which Stoltenberg responded, President Putin's rhetoric on nuclear issues is reckless and dangerous. NATO's response is that we strongly believe that we should continue to work for nuclear disarmament, but at the same time, we also made it clear that as long as there are nuclear weapons, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. As long as nuclear weapons exist, we have to make sure that we have the nuclear deterrence, which is safe, secure, and effective. This message of ironclad commitment to defending every inch of NATO territory with acknowledgement of the role nuclear weapons play in NATO's deterrence strategy has been a constant throughout the crisis. Nuclear deterrence plays less of an explicit role than it does in Putin's messaging, but it's also perhaps less important because if, I mean, if Putin started this conflict with any confidence that he could prevail in conventional war against NATO after weeks of uh, struggling against the Ukrainian armed forces, I can't imagine that he has any such confidence today. So we can't really say whether the fact that Russia has not expanded the war beyond Ukraine is a success for US NATO nuclear deterrence, but I also don't think we can say whether nuclear deterrence inherently favors the aggressor. Next slide, please. So on from uh, deterrence success to lessons on deterrence failure, specifically, failure to deter Russia's invasion. Here I'd like to make uh, one, uh, what I'll say is a, is a, a low value point. Uh, next slide, please. A low value point about nuclear deterrence failure, and then a hopefully a uh, more valuable point about general deterrence failure. The, the relatively low uh, value point about nuclear deterrence failure follows from a March 11th article in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in which the author, this is Daryl Kimball, states Putin's invasion also underscores a reality. Contrary to myth, nuclear weapons don't prevent major wars. Um, so, I mean, the, I think the, the only significant reality this actually underscores is a, is a failure of, of analysis. So yes, the, the fact that uh, nuclear weapons uh, exist in the world does not prevent all war. And yes, a state that does not possess nuclear weapons and is not covered by uh, extended nuclear deterrence cannot rely upon nuclear deterrence to prevent its enemy from invading, but there's limited value in uh, making these, these points because as far as I, I've seen, no one is really arguing the contrary. So the, the more interesting piece has to do with general deterrence failure. Specifically, why did the United States fail to deter Russia from invading Ukraine? 
In a recent uh, Horns of a Dilemma podcast, a panelist argued that the problem was insufficient U.S. credibility. I, I don't actually think that's right. Rather, I think it, this is a lack of willingness to impose and therefore to threaten to impose sufficient cost. This is actually a case of, of rather clear deterrence messaging and follow through. In the lead up to the invasion, the United States repeatedly warned Putin to de-escalate or face the consequences. And the United States stated clearly what it would do in response to an invasion, impose severe and unprecedented uh, economic sanctions, <clears throat> and what it would not do, uh, send US forces to fight in Ukraine. I have not seen any evidence to suggest that Putin didn't believe the United States would follow through on its deterrent threat. And when deterrence failed, the United States did indeed follow through. So it wasn't so much a lack of credibility as a case where Putin looked at what we were threatening, compared it to the perceived uh, value of what he was seeking, um, and the expected gains outweigh the threatened cost. Again, given the asymmetry of stakes, we were not willing to accept the risks associated with imposing a cost sufficient to deter. And, and to extrapolate a bit, and I'm not a, a, a game theorist, but it seems um, pretty reasonable to expect that when a, a strategy of escalation dominance faces off against a strategy uh, oriented around minimizing escalation risk, that first strategy wins out. Two caveats here. <clears throat> first, it appears that Putin was surprised by the severity of uh, the economic costs imposed and by the consensus willingness of Europe to impose them. Perhaps uh, if we had uh, specified precisely what the response would be, it would have been a deterrent success. Well, <clears throat> that wasn't really uh, an option <clears throat> because it appears that even the Europeans were surprised by what the Europeans were, were willing to do. So what they would have signed up for <clears throat> prior to experiencing the shock of an invasion that many did not believe was going to happen probably would have been substantially less than what actually proved possible. And second, Putin's apparent miscalculation of the economic response does not necessarily mean that it would have been sufficient to deter if known in advance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> There's one more, I think, really interesting aspect of this example of deterrence failure. And that is President Biden's suggestion, albeit perhaps an off-the-cuff suggestion, that this was not a deterrent strategy at all. Despite many statements from, from senior leaders in, the, in the, the weeks prior to the, uh, to the um, invasion, the president's February 24th press conference included the, the following excerpted exchange. So he's asked, sanctions clearly have not been enough to deter Vladimir Putin to this point. What is going to stop him? How and when does this end? To which President Biden says, no one expected the sanctions to prevent anything from happening. This is going to take time. And what we have to, and we have to show resolve so he knows what's coming. And so the people of Russia know what he's brought on them. That's what this is all about. He's not going to say, oh my God, these sanctions are coming. I'm going to stand down. He's going to test the resolve of the West and see if we stay together. And we will. We will, and it will impose significant costs on him. To which the, the, the reporter asks, if, if sanctions cannot stop President Putin, what penalty can? Biden, I didn't say sanctions couldn't stop him, but you've been talking about the threat of these sanctions for several weeks now. Yes, but the threat of the sanctions and imposing the sanctions and seeing the effect of the sanctions are two different things. And he's going to begin to see the effect of the sanctions. And what will that do? How will that change his mindset here, given he's attacking Ukraine as we speak? Because it will so weaken his country that he'll have to make a very, very difficult choice of whether to continue to move towards being a second-rate power or, in fact, respond. Close quote. Now, whether this was the intent all along, and I, I should add that um, he repeated this idea just a couple of weeks ago, the president is saying that the imposition of sanctions was actually part of a compellent strategy rather than a deterrent strategy. These are both forms of coercion. Deterrence is about convincing someone not to do something, and compellence is about convincing someone to do something. And even if it wasn't the strategy all along, it certainly is now that any strategy for deterring the invasion has failed. Now, theories of coercion would suggest that we take a pessimistic view of this strategy. Compellence is generally believed to be more difficult than deterrence, in part, because according to prospect theory, we tend to assign greater value to something that we possess in hand 
than we do prior to the acquisition, and because the expenditure of sunk costs tends to lead us to overvalue objects of our desire. So if the threatened action failed to deter, we should not expect the same action to compel a reversal after the fact. However, this case provides interesting insight into circumstances where compellants might actually succeed where deterrence has failed. This is a situation involving multiple compounded miscalculations. Putin appears to have overestimated the effectiveness that Russia's military would have in this conflict, underestimated the Ukrainians' determination to fight, and may still be uncertain regarding how long a unified Europe is willing to hold with the United States in this course. It is conceivable that severe sanctions might eventually tip the scales in a way that the threat of sanctions could not do when the weight of these other factors was misjudged. And while you know, we, we can't say at this time, maybe that is playing a role in, in what now might be um, uh, a kind of reformulation of, of his war aims. Uh, next slide, please. And the next topic that I'll, I'll, I'd like to touch on is nuclear doctrine, strategy, and declaratory policy. In a crisis, we can look to establish declaratory policy for insight into how an adversary might act, and we can observe deterrent signaling and threats to gauge our pre-conflict understanding of nuclear declaratory policy. Over the past several years, there's been vigorous debate among Western policymakers and analysts over the meaning of Russia's declaratory policy regarding potential nuclear employment. In 2020, Russia uh, published a document uh, that repeated the same declaratory policy, uh, policy language established in the 2014 Russian military doc uh, doctrine. That says that the Russian Federation reserves the right to use nuclear weapons in response to the use of nuclear and other types of weapons of mass destruction against it and or its allies, as well as in the event of aggression against the Russian Federation with the use of conventional weapons when the very existence of the state is threatened. So what should we expect in this crisis based on Russia's established declaratory policy? Well, it turns out that establishing a declaratory policy does not necessarily provide a full measure of clarity in crisis and conflict. Much of the previous debate about this policy is centered on the question of what, of, 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 um, what constitutes aggression that threatens the very existence of the state. Does this mean that nuclear employment uh, is only on the table in the event of something like large-scale NATO invasion of Russia? Or is it the case that any threat to Putin's regime is essentially a, a threat to the existence of the state? In a June 2020 uh, article in War on the Rocks, Cynthia Roberts concludes that, that this document shows that, that, quote, Russian nuclear doctrine is focused more on ensuring deterrence and less on nuclear coercion for aggressive aims. This might suggest that we needn't worry much about Russian nuclear employment absent some truly significant shift in the nature of the current conflict. On the other hand, if you can go to the, the next slide, Putin's February 24th speech, this is the same one where he threatened uh, any that intervene with unprecedented consequences, also includes language that, that I think has underappreciated relevance to nuclear declaratory policy. Putin says, even now, with NATO's eastward expansion, the situation for Russia has become worse, is becoming worse and more dangerous by the year. Any further expansion of NATO's infrastructure or the ongoing efforts to gain a military foothold of the Ukrainian territory are unacceptable for us. The problem is that in territories adjacent to Russia, which I have to note is our historical land, a hostile anti-Russia is taking place for the United States, uh, it is a policy, and its allies, it is a policy of containing Russia. For our country, it is a matter of life and death, a matter of our historical future as a nation. This is not an exaggeration. This is a fact. It is not only a very real threat to our interests, but to the very existence of our state and to its sovereignty. It is the red line, which we have spoken about on numerous occasions. They have crossed it. Next slide, please. Please note the commonalities between these two statements, nuclear declaratory policy, when the very existence of the state is threatened, uh, comments on NATO expansion, a very real threat to the very existence of our state and to its sovereignty. The, the red line that we have spoken about on numerous occasions, they have crossed it past tense. So given Putin's hands-on approach to nuclear capabilities and exercises and policy, I expect that he is fully aware of the identical verbiage in these two instances. 
If so, what was the intent of this statement? I think it tends to support a broader rather than narrower interpretation of what might lead Putin to consider nuclear use. Now, that's not to say that this speech provides a stated intent to use nuclear weapons in or around this conflict, but I do think it was meant to signal extremely high stakes and that it points to the rhetorical foundation Putin would use if at any point in the conflict he did decide on nuclear employment and that he would anchor any such employment in Russia's existing declaratory policy. And it's also worth noting that this reading of, of Putin's warning would imply a justification for quote unquote defensive nuclear employment in the context of a war of Russian aggression. So beyond uh, perhaps rhetorical justification after the fact, what purpose does Russia's declaratory policy serve if the conditions for employment are essentially always in a continual state of having been met? Well, it would seem to uh, help enable a strategy of nuclear coercion across broad levels of crisis and conflict. And I think to some extent we're seeing that today. Greater ambiguity might serve to amplify that ever-present threat that leaves something to chance. The last point I'll make here uh, is that there's been lots of recent discussion about the risks of, of Russian nuclear use uh, in response to US military involvement, lots of discussion about what nuclear capabilities Russia might employ, but not a lot of discussion about whether potential employment scenarios would be consistent with Russia's declaratory policy, aside from uh, Russian declaratory policy experts like uh, Kristen Van Bruisgaard. And I should also point out that just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Kremlin spokesperson um, uh, Dmitry Peskov has himself referenced this declaratory policy in a couple of interviews uh, with CNN and then with, with PBS. And he says, the Ukraine conflict has nothing to do with any threat to Russia's existence. Any outcome of the operation, of course, is not a reason for usage of a nuclear weapon. Uh, existence of the state and special military operation, they have nothing to do with each other and, and so on. He does describe it as a uh, warning different states not to interfere in the affairs of Ukraine and Russia. You know, all this consider, I, I do think it suggests that in, in crisis and conflict, military capabilities and tailored threats delivered in the moment play a much more significant role then does declaratory policy established in uh, prior years. Next slide, please. So there are just four more topics I'm gonna to touch on uh, uh, very, very quickly. The first involves challenges of communicating uh, and interpreting nuclear signaling in crisis. Many analysts have noticed that clear nuclear deterrent signaling in crisis can be very difficult. And many of us who have participated in tabletop exercises have found that to be true. The current crisis involves elements of nuclear signaling on both the Russian and the US sides. And I think that the evidence suggests that coarse level nuclear signaling works reasonably fine, while finer grained nuanced signaling in this crisis is either absent or if it is present, it is uh, not really understood. So on one hand, Putin's nuclear signaling, and we've talked about some of these pieces before, really send a clear general signal that, that US or NATO military involvement would risk Russian nuclear escalation. And on the US side, you see signaling uh, that sends a clear general signal that the United States seeks to avoid directly increasing nuclear escalation risk. That said, some elements of, sim of signaling may have been missed. I highlighted the previous instance of what may have been Putin uh, intending to provide an explicit link to his nuclear declaratory policy, but that was largely not heard in that context. On the whole, I don't see a lot of people looking for or claiming to derive particularly nuanced messaging from these elements of nuclear signaling. No suggestion, for example, that Putin's strategic exercises immediately prior to the invasion were meant to convey which nuclear weapons he would employ if it came to that, or how he would employ them, or how he would seek to limit nuclear employment uh, to manage escalation risk. Short of direct statements, it probably really is difficult to signal that kind of nuance. One other note here is that nuclear posture changes will be read as general signaling. And so for stable deterrence, this suggests that the, 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 the optimum is to have the ability for signaling via visible nuclear changes to posture, but without requiring those visible posture changes for credible uh, implementation of deterrence threats. That is to be able to signal if you want to, but not to depend on those actions that will be read as signaling whether or not uh, you want them to be ready in that way. Next slide, please. Nuclear capabilities. In an actual crisis, what capabilities, what nuclear capabilities worry us the most? Which provide the, the, the most likely pathways to nuclear use? 
For years, DOD and many analysts have argued that in the contemporary security environment, nuclear first use is most likely to occur in the context of a regional war of aggression in which Russia, or maybe China, faces defeat, and that within that context, Russia's large and diverse stockpile of non-strategic nuclear weapons poses the greatest risk. I think that we can now say that the thing we said we, should wor we would worry about in a conflict is indeed the thing that we worry about in a conflict. So uh, there's been a, a great deal of concern raised in recent weeks that Putin, in the event of US-NATO military involvement, uh, or maybe otherwise facing a strategic defeat in Ukraine, might escalate to limited employment of non-strategic nuclear weapons. This is, of course, largely self-referential, and it should come as no surprise, but it's still worth noting. We're not suddenly worried most about, about say, limited ICBM strikes on the U.S. homeland. So does this mean that non-strategic nuclear weapons are destabilizing? Do they pose a significant risk to strategic stability? To me, a nuclear capability weakens strategic stability if it creates an incentive for one or both sides to choose nuclear escalation first or early. A broader formulation might say that a capability threatens uh, stability if it increases the likelihood that the possessor chooses nuclear escalation at any time. So uh, I would say that uh, NSNW tends to fail that first test. They don't generally create incentive for first or early use, but that Russia's NSNW uh, do satisfy that broader formulation. However unlikely it is that Putin will choose nuclear escalation, it seems that he may be less likely absent his NSNW force. The problem with this broader formulation is, is first, that's not what strategic stability traditionally means. And second, one could then argue that possession of any nuclear capability increases the likelihood that the possessor chooses nuclear use, in which case any and all nuclear weapons are bad for strategic stability. And in this sense, I, I think that's a less useful formulation in terms of, of, of guiding uh, force posture decisions. Next slide, please. What are the implications of the Ukraine conflict for U.S. extended deterrence and assurance? Does Putin's invasion of Ukraine signal that, that Poland might be next? And has this played out in ways that weaken our alliances and undermine our ability to assure allies? I think that so far the answer to these questions is no. First, the distinction between Ukraine and NATO, member, uh, and NATO members appears clear to all parties. Across the alliance and throughout the crisis, there have been numerous reiterations, and I've referenced some of them before, about the commitment to defend every inch of NATO territory. No hint that anyone would be prepared, for example, to write off uh, Eastern members of the alliance. No hint that Putin does not understand this distinction. On the contrary, Russia has argued against further NATO enlargement, partially on the grounds that it would provide a mechanism for Ukraine to force NATO participation in aggression against Russia that Ukraine claims, falsely, that uh, Ukraine plans to undertake. We also don't see NATO non-members concluding that US security commitments are no good. Instead, we see Ukraine saying that if it had been granted NATO membership, none of this would have happened. And we see unprecedented levels of discussion in Finland and Sweden about potentially pursuing NATO membership in what would be a dramatic reversal of decades old policy. Uh, next and final slide. Finally, I'll conclude with, with lessons and implications for arms control. Not surprisingly, <clears throat> limiting the military capabilities of potential adversaries, as does the New START Treaty, with which Russia continues to comply, tends to be more valuable than commitments regarding the posturing or movement of existing forces, as provided for under the Vienna document, which Russia easily ignored in the run-up to its invasion. It takes time to develop and deploy new military capabilities in violation of an agreement, but it may take no time at all to fail to provide notice regarding an exercise or deployment. And with regard to the potential for future nuclear arms control, Putin's war in Ukraine makes a hard problem even harder. <clears throat> Existing mistrust is further amplified. Any spirit of cooperation is damaged or destroyed. An already short timeline for replacing the New START Treaty is further truncated and the already difficult challenge of securing congressional support for new agreements is compounded. Furthermore, Russia's longstanding reluctance to engage on the top U.S. arms control priority of limiting all nuclear warheads, including non-strategic nuclear uh, weapons that Russia sees as critical to offsetting its perceived conventional inferiority, is not going to be uh, helped by Russia's discovery that its conventional forces are failing to deliver in Ukraine. 
That said, Russia's invasion does not change the fundamental strategic logic of U.S.-Russian arms control and the value in limiting Russian nuclear capabilities. The fact that today we are worried Putin might use non-strategic nuclear weapons in Ukraine certainly only reinforces that limiting Russia's NSNW would serve U.S. and allied security interests. So the United States should not abandon its objective of sustaining U.S.-Russian nuclear arms control beyond the February 2026 expiration of New START. And given the current uh, suspension of the Strategic Stability Dialogue and the truncated timeline, the U.S. interagency should continue the internal work necessary to be prepared to resume dialogue and to pursue substantive and fulsome bilateral engagement if and when conditions are right. And with that, I will conclude and thank you for your, uh, for your attention and look forward to the discussion.